Hello everyone, today we introduce the Roman conquest of Italy passing through the main political and military events of the process. It's not the first time we discuss archaic Roman warfare and we will keep doing it hopefully as uh, from some time I have told you we will and this is what today's video is fundamentally about as a starter discussing um, the era more, more in depth right for number of reasons. First of all, of course, the, the general historical interest per se, but especially stressing what we have already highlighted in the uh, Indo-European religious history videos, and also the strictly military historical ones concerning the, the, the Roman army in general that we made hundreds of videos on, and that many channels, of course, cover for, for obvious reasons, but that you know, rarely actually focus on, in, in, in fact, in its genesis, in its beginning, why did Rome come to be a power of the scale that we know to have changed the world forever? Uh, and uh, rarely you, you find uh, even a very, um, you know, convincing explanation for this all. It's definitely a big um, philosophical even before then, historical question, because you have to, uh, first of all, ask yourself what it is that you are really looking for and how much you are willing to accept, essentially, a deep misconception uh, regarding uh, not just the subject matter, but the, the entire history for the way it's been essentially told to us. I already highlighted, essentially, the, the major um, uh, say element right in, in the in the nature of, of Roman civilization that is essentially the shift uh, of the Mediterranean from the civilization of the mother of the um, Neolithic Bronze Age uh, cultures uh, to the virile celestial um, military uh, order right of the Indo-European conquerors, uh, which in the case of Rome comes from a situation which, of course, uh, the, the, the Latins, the Italics, had already, in fact, uh, you know, em emerged um, after the, 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 set the Indo-European settlement as such, and of course they were essentially the, um, the, the direct, um, uh, let's say, successors of, of the conquerors, but that as other conquerors elsewhere had already been giving way essentially to the to majority to this um, uh, you know constant uh, uh, erosion of, of the roots of, of the universal tree um, and um, in this sense coming less to the standards that were the, the divine one the traditional ones that uh, at this point hardly any people was already um, you know, uh, abiding anymore. And this is, um, of course, um, a, a, an explanation which requires a certain background, not just in the um, history of religions per se, but also in the general uh, appreciation of um, the, the cultures of the time. Because I realized that um, I get lots of followers and I see my videos circulating, if anything, just because they tag me in them. I have this ungrateful and, and sorrowful um, task of checking at least, you know, what, what the thing is about. And uh, most of the times you realize that content like mine is swallowed just by people who essentially think they are traditionalists and basically do not understand anything about it. Uh, they, they just uh, essentially buy a sort of uh, exhibitionistic uh, narcissism, uh, thinking that just what they, they look like as young stupid people uh, has anything to do with being, you know, a, you know some sort of Indo-European hero uh, or whatever. And this is the sad product of the Fort Estaders, uh, nationalist and or socialist because at the end of the day they're saying thing, but they don't know it. So uh, don't tell them if you don't want to crush their their dreams, uh, because um, the the world order will surely do it for them or time. Um, today we're not 
actually talking about history of religion per se. We will just look at the political and territorial nature of the Roman expansion, the peoples fundamentally that Rome clashed uh, against that are uh, the, the most important element, of course, because of just the traditional view of life and uh, the uh, organization of of its community. Um, it's um, um, it's a of course topic that you can easily uh, learn from any uh, any book. Like you can simply read Levy, or you know, taking Polybius awards on, on Roman imperialism. You can of course appreciate the historiography that exists today. And so this is just a a first step of a probably one hour and a half, two hours long video. Um, not more, you know, it in advance at least to, to what my voice is speaking by the time you can listen to it. Um, and it can, of course, be stretched enormously because the uh, the information we have about these um, Italian populations is substantial, right? Just a couple of weeks ago I made that video about the 4th century BC uh, Italic uh, spears and javelins um, evolution, right? And from that evidence also explaining a bit of the um, change of the warfare in the Italian peninsula exactly through the uh, moment of greatest expansion so you, in relative terms because the, the speed in fact of the Roman conquest was uh, incredible between this, uh, m especially mid fourth to beginning of the third century BC. Right, they pass essentially from Latium to mm, dominate the entire central and southern um, Italy, and from there basically not meeting any other major um, resistance, um, except for the ones that could come from. Uh, uh, the outer world, let's say, but that's also another story, and we'll have to discuss it, of course, also through our Hellenistic Warfare series um, and more. But as I explained already in in other videos about archaic Rome, what what is crucial to me, and um, I think for say what, what I do here in function of a kind of a waking up of, of Western civilization as such, is um, the of course the um appreciation in a sort of scientific and moral fashion of the not just of the nature of roman warfare and consequently politics and culture but also one of the other peoples that not just rome fought against but that would become as you know the uh, italian sulky that would fundamentally be the conquerors of the outer world, and that would make the Roman Empire, at least as we know it, in a in a narrower sense, as the Imperium already existed, and it doesn't have to do exactly with uh, the, the the colonizing kind of uh, nature of Roman warfare and of an ethnic heartland hegemonizing the the surrounding uh, space and fundamentally. Uh, the, the the known world uh, of the time, um, so uh, there is, as you understand, really a lot there uh, that deserves also to pass through a series like uh, the one I started recently about the Celtic peoples, for example. Like looking at them one by one, it would be beautiful to talk about the Italic ones, such as the Samnites, uh, the, the the same Latins, the Umbrians, and and more, because um, very often that sustratum uh, escapes kind of even just popular knowledge and people just talk about Rome, the Romans, the Italics, the Italian peoples, etc. And they hardly even distinguish what, what it means, right? Um, uh, that in, in practice, to, 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 to realize what Rome did um, in, in Italy at the time. And that's where, of course, the, the spiritual kind of traditional approach must be actually um, brought on the floor, because the thing that doesn't explain itself, you can't explain this in, in socio-economical terms merely, right? Rome was, yes, uh, the largest city in Latium by the time we start, uh, of course, appreciating its uh, 
its rise. We're talking about the, the seventh, the sixth centuries, and there is all the, the the age of kings, which is another thing, the, the period of Etruscan. Um, uh, some say a German, but it's also kind of an influence in, in, in some ways. That, um, in fact, this uh, attention to this Sinoicism that um, is often too stressed as ah, Rome was a multicultural thing, you know, and so that's the secret of their success. Um, you know, if we're talking about culture in a, in a broad sense, of course, um, it's obvious, right? Every, every country, every people... Um, Every culture is a product of a multicultural uh, situation. Like you, you can't. There is no. The, where, where, where do you put the criterion? Again, just the the aforementioned um, fourth estaters and less other lesser people can think that uh, you know reality is just just uh, either black or white per se. Um, but they they don't um, and they don't realize. And in fact, the the only way to actually make it back to black and white is uh, sorting it out in the first place. And so it, that's exactly what they are not doing. So just traditionally, they're doomed to fail without any uh, any appeal. So of course, the history of Rome is also quite fascinating in the genesis of of the orbs per se. And we can't see this also in other videos today. We will not do it because. Um, it's kind of a more complex topic that that it seems, and uh, it only partially has to do eventually with the, um, at least with the period that we treat uh, today, right? So we can start appreciating, of course, this conglomeration of villages and different cultures, mostly um, uh, Latin and uh, Sabellic as well, um, but also this this pinch of, of Etruscan. Uh, and uh, and 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 else, right? Because um, the, just, there are some elements such as the Faliscans, for example, that hardly everybody remembers, and or even um, some coming from from the outer world, right? In the same Roman uh, aristocracy, but there is hardly any uh, doubt that uh, from the um, Battle of the Lake Regillus, let's say, so traditionally between 499 and 496, and the Gallic sack of Rome in 390, Rome um, already fought all or most of her wars in alliance with the other Latin communities, and after 486, the Erniki, you will see them now, they were an, an Italic people, they weren't Latins, um, to um, say thereby using for the first time, in fact, allies, right? So a major feature of Roman warfare, um, as in terms of manpower at the time, because of course the the peoples they, that uh, surrounded Rome were pretty homogeneous, um, one another, to counteract, in fact, the numerical superiority of the Roman opponents which is also another aspect that um, especially those who don't like the Romans because again think that there is something uh, strange old multicultural anti-traditional in them because they have both basically the history of, 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 of the last couple of hundred years and have completely lost just uh, as a consequence of the same mechanism any notion of what actual tradition really is actually must stress that Rome was some sort of, you know, giant machine. Well, no, we, we start talking um, from the actual, like, as other great conquerors in history, the, the Mongols, etc., um, there was this idea that there were somehow swarms, and they were often, more often than not, actually, uh, inferior numerically to their opponents. Um, and um, even, in fact, uh, systematically so, Right, and this is the case for Rome as well, and surely for the major um, conquests that that she accomplished, uh, and um, uh, which is the same reason why we actually even remember of such things. And starting from the origins of the uh, uh, Roman Empire is uh, also the the best way to highlight fundamentally the, the Roman success, but also trying to to explain it. For, for what it was. Um, 
I'm planning from, from a couple of years now, I still haven't done it, to make a video properly titled Feudal Rome, which is um, more or less, in fact, the period we, I, I just outlined, right, from the beginning of the 5th to uh, the beginning of the 4th century BC, right. Um, this was essentially um, the period uh, during which Rome um, was uh, influenced by the, uh, the Etruscan um, uh, presence, like to a point that um, the city had not yet uh, managed to configure herself as um, a unitary power as such. It was essentially ruled by the great Roman feudal clans and the um, let's say the, the cooperation with the I'm, I'm approximating brutally but with the so called populace right uh, that the plebs, if you want, there are two different things, and again, there is a, an enormous historiography about this because it's we fundamentally don't know also as much as we would like to. But um, the the outline, after all, is is simpler than it seems, right? So, what would make Rome great with the Camillian reform, and so this recurrent motive of Western civilization that is the an, an enlightened elite that manages to redeem through military power, the mass of the people, and so elevating it to the imperial divine horizons, right, is something that first of all has with Rome the greatest peak, right, in all the history of mankind. I mean, there is no other people that achieved what Rome achieved the way she did, right? This is not about how many people she ruled or um, you know, how large the empire was or uh, how much it lasted, all elements that alone could also, in relative terms to, to the ages, actually make Rome uh, first in this sense. But properly, again, the aforementioned switch, the, the realization in a world so tumultuous and so, um, if you want, um, in fact, titanic, Right, Dionysian, Telluric, agitated by ferocious forces, was able to bring order, clarity, and light, uh, and authority, and discipline, and hierarchy, uh, to, in fact, transfigure it, and reestablishing the Golden Age between, uh, essentially, the, the Bronze and the Iron One, as the, the older prophecies um, in, in, in many cultures of the time had actually, in fact, prefigured. Um, and this is, um, of course, important for us today because um, when you look at, at a feudal reality, you realize that Rome um, had been thus like a very different from that kind of model. I mean, feudalism is definitely uh, capable of carrying out, in fact, the same uh, the, the, the same result. It was that essentially the Roman senators that uh, managed to uh, carry out this true um, paradigm shift in, in universal history and um, thus revealing the potential that that elite can have. Um, from an heroic background, of course, from a the, the recovery of a important set of sacral um, uh, awareness um, but again from a background that had forced them to recognize the weakness of essentially just a, uh, not an anarchic but you know a stateless and uh, decentralized reality that was easy prey of the hungrier neighbors of Rome that we will see now Right, so the, the idea and the, the chronology is that even as far as the military is concerned is that probably there is some you know, overlapping there because the Serbian reform so allegedly occurred in, in an Etruscan period was um, of course a democratic one one that would remain essentially until the Marian reform uh, based on the idea that just the, the, say, the, the, the most powerful you were of course and the um, uh, you know, the, the more you had to contribute to the to the army, but you know, even the same concept of an army, or even the need of you know having one when you're de facto just a feudal lord in that fashion that spends his entire life on horseback, uh, massacring people in large numbers, is actually 
a contradiction, and this is in fact what the Etruscan culture was about, right? A hyper-powerful elite, but basically um, a broken population of serfs, right? That um, couldn't quite provide with that bulk of uh, force you find, in fact, in the Roman uh, army from chameleon times onwards. Um, thus, Rome, as always, is, is a crossroad, like a, all the, the, the most successful civilizations in history between tradition and modernity, right? In other words, there is a point in which, uh, which tradition can be also uh, stagnating, right? The same process of, you know, decadence of the, um, of the celestial standards had occurred because of, of a normal, Mechanism. It, 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 just to see it from a materialistic point of view, it's the second principle of thermodynamics. But it's obviously moral and spiritual, first of all. Um, and as the same Etruscans have celestial, virile, um, you know, uh, and um, properly, even in the European elements, as a matter of fact, even though, of course, as you know, the Etruscan origins are debated. This is another thing. But here we're talking about something that went beyond the same in the European world. I mean, there was a tradition that was known by by basically everyone, that just by different degrees was being abided to. And this, that's what we're saying before, and that most people do not accept, because they essentially just are racist, or at least in the contemporary fashion today, which is zoological materialism word of Marxism um, and uh, racism in, in the ancient world which existed and in a much more brutally impacting way that you can um, imagine um, it is of course clothed with the with the and you know permeated with the concept of transfiguration which by itself is against any uh, physical determinism um, and that, therefore, is incongruent with any possible form of tradition. Again, don't tell um, uh, the uh, you know the misfit uh, neo-Nazi kids because you know they didn't have a parental upbringing, and therefore you know it's already if they can't fit uh, first world primary education standards. But this is also what most people actually believe today. So this is a a very serious problem. As much as the fact that, I, I mean, communists, I mean, we, we live in a world in which communists actually exist. I mean, and it's not a joke, right? And uh, they exist only because, of course, the system has allowed for lesser people to, to, to maintain themselves without any, any accomplishment of any kind. And thus, you will have ever more of them because it's, of course, uh, an autoimmune mental disease and it hardly can be fixed by, uh, you know, by essentially po keeping to, to poison that, that those people in the same process. So we are, of course, nationalism is just the last step before communism in the, um, the generation of tradition. Um, but again, uh, you wonder why probably some of you will at least think why I, I talked about these things, because you cannot study the history of Rome without confronting yourself with the entire meaning of of life in the first place. I mean, it, 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 the Roman history is practically the only possible, um, uh, you know, or at least the best properly, because even if you look at the Veda, we, we basically just have the their texts. We, we can't even track them archaeologically, right? Rome is something, again, at the crossroad between tradition and modernity. And so we have this unspeakable privilege of being able to study her history um, and uh, and of course as much as we are lucky for example that the Romans documented uh, peoples like the, the Germanic ones or the Celtic ones in essentially a prehistoric state making understand even what happened in, in the before right in the times in which the Romans in fact just like the Germans later on wouldn't wouldn't write for themselves um, and that we wouldn't know uh, anything otherwise. So, not just as Westerners, but as humans, our only possibility of, of salvation passes through the knowledge of Roman history and, and more, because it's essentially a Catholic history, right? So, it, it's completely 
uh, and unavoidably hinged with the fullest traditional meaning of divine power. In no, in no other way, any power could have manifested the way it did um, in the case of Rome. Now, it's important to stress again the passage from feudalism to what people call the republic, even though it wasn't a republic in the um, in a way we just mean it, and it wasn't actually quite the only thing ex existing, right? Um, with uh, as far as the Roman institutional political institutional system was was concerned, because the senatorial elite was always in charge, right? Uh, sometimes I find it cute when people say, well, why do you say that? I don't know. Uh, once I made a video about Caesar's dictatorship, and there were people saying, but why do you say that Caesar was a dictator? Um, well, because if you don't know what a dictator is in the Roman institutional political system, it means that, again, you have not received the, the, the famously aforementioned first word primary education, um, and you shouldn't even be on YouTube to, to say bullshit. But secondly, questions like, you know, if uh, literally the question was, what do you say that Caesar was a dictator if, if Rome was a republic or and, and not democracy, right? This is gener welcome to Generation Z, right? Essentially a generation without past and without future, without hope. And I think without any, you know, without much else, as a matter of fact, but that's why... and. I think the Roman example in this sense, given its, its context and background, is still the mean to show how divine potential is always there and can be revived to the extremes that at least uh, humanity has um, ever known in the age of man, at least. Um, so Rome was borderline also as far as this chronological division, as you know, a repartition. Um, but feudalism is, is essentially what we're re reverting to today, right? We can say, uh, yes, it's good that the most uh, stupid, weak elements today are basically, you know, paying for the, the damage that they bring to reality, right? Because there is no such thing like, you know, some victim out there that couldn't, in fact, redeem themselves. Um, and uh, if you look at what the masses do, what the average... Uh, you know, left and right, etc. What the average person has become. Of course, you cannot help but, you know, feeling somehow satisfied that they're sinking again in, in wealth, in, you know, in standards, etc. They're becoming essentially in the new servants. It's perfectly normal in the universal order of things. The problem is, however, that at that point, there, there would have to be an elite to, to, to take on... Uh, their shoulder, the, the shortcomings of, of the rest of the people. And this is what we have lived, uh, of course, through, through different ages. Like, for example, since the, the 1300s to the, the 1700s, the, the 1800s. Um, and um, it, it's basically going back to, to, to that again. But at the same time, it would be better, and this is what the entire Roman deal was, as far as also, in fact, we will see now the Chameleon reform was concerned, is that conferring the imperium, so the, the munus in terms of duty and reward, um, civically, um, to, in fact, uh, express the divine potential of mankind, right, from, in fact, all the elements, because even even any classes distinction is is just uh, a Marxist abortion. There is no such thing like classes, right? There, there are, if you believe that you are marked for life in being, in fact, you know, either, either a, a, a greater or, or a lesser person, but it doesn't work like that because even the elite can sclerotize and weaken and sink and... Um, even who's left there, it has the possibility of reverting, at least. And not that things are not meant to go always worse over time, but, you know, to, to do something about the whole thing. Um, so Rome was also an exceptional case in this, uh, in this trend, because um, there wouldn't be historically any coming back of that proportion from, in fact, the degeneration that happened since the time of the fall. Right, so there were ups and downs, of course, but none of the scale we could see for uh, in, in Roman history.
Uh, and so feudalism, we will talk about that, is, is also the nurturing moment of this extremely ferocious um, elite uh, that is embodied by, you know, the, the beautiful armor of Lanuvi. I mean, the, there is really, even there, a lot that we haven't covered yet, but essentially mentioned this powerful clan leaders, like the Patres Familias of uh, the, the the Latin world. Um, and, of course, the, the, the surrounding peoples, as we'll see now, didn't keep either, but, uh, again, Rome was also a bit something else, like properly already a city, and already ordered, in fact, with this uh, quite mm, um, iron-cold hierarchical you know, notion of how things should work for a civilization in Nutan, uh, uh, uh already, already ingrained because of this constant frontier status that Rome had historically. Um, and that could be expressed by managing ever more people, cattle, lands, the properties, um, houses uh, in the city, um, and thus playing Right, toying with this command capacity, and um, in, in some, of, in fact, the most radically and traumatically brutal kind of clanic feuds that you can imagine, aggressions from um, basically all the peoples, as we'll see now, dwelling um, around Rome, and in, in a land that was full of resources, right, in, moral and material alike, and that thus. Um, felt like from, from these people in perspective as the, the clash of the Ezer uh, against the, the Van and right in, in a, uh, the, the idea of a, of a celestial divine order that has to tame these titanic um, chthonic uh, telluric forces that are also terrifying that, that however are needed as we've seen to be evoked sacrally in order to be able for, for the hero to tame them and thus transfiguring and transcending um, uh, his mortality. Um, this is the awareness that, of course, takes place in Rome. We have mostly as sources the, the the sagas. Then we have, of course, um, Hellenistic authors. Um, we don't know as much as we would like to know about the Roman religion. I mean, we know much more about, say, the, the Norse one, thanks to, in fact, the you know literacy in Europe later on, than we know about the early Roman. That, of course, authors like Dumenzil, Altheim, etc. Um, we'll talk about them at some point, of course. Um, you can, of course, uh, re uh, appre appreciate um, again, uh, also philologically, just from a literary point of view, etc. The in incredible amount, in, the, in, in this sense, the primitiveness of of Roman culture. At the moment of her rise to to domination, uh, is the the key in many ways of um, of the, the the purity of that principle, right? That, but always stressing that this was um, was not a rain injection. You see, you know, when you look at the Achaemenid Empire, you basically see the usual kind of Indo-European takeover of essentially a you know, Middle Eastern civilization, etc. And th this was an autochthonous uh, re-edition, right? Uh, you know, here carefully, people were still obsessed with the concept of Blut und Boden because, you know, of course, rooting for the dirt uh, is not really a, you know, a, a traditional principle in the first place. But, you know, if you are r really obsessed about, you know, peoples that made it at some point, or great conquerors, whatever, just know that the Romans started the whole thing from just their home, right? They weren't re-injected magically at that point. The um, the Italic, mi the Indo-European migrations in, in Italy had already been over from, from quite a while um, before Rome uh, carried out this this paradigm shift. Um, and so it, it's something much more um, exoterically revealing than you normally um, can, can imagine. So... Um, the, we will talk about fuel of Rome again in, in detail, but it's at that point when, especially a, an Etruscan leadership that had tended, in, in a, at least with fundamentally royal tendencies, to, of course, make leverage on the people, 
rather than on the on the aristocracy left collapsed that Rome was left essentially defenseless and so the the, the the senatorial oligarchy had to take matters in their own hands and to realize that without reconnecting the uranic with the tonic the um, the, aristo the aristocracy with 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 the plebs um, they could have not literally even had the numbers that as we'll see now also throughout the the, the, the following you know centuries were smaller than the ones of, of, of the Roman opponents to succeed in the first place. And Rome was really heavily threatened, right, uh, for many reasons. Uh, of course, the, the big center in the, in the Tiber Valley, surrounded by essentially the Apennines, and so all these mountaineer populations that uh, took a liking for the ancient... Um, we, we will talk about the Verse Sacrum at some point, and you know the, what, what's the principle behind that, when raiding, um, invading... Uh, but also settling and um, fundamentally re rejuvenating in the eternal uh, Apollonian cycle uh, that also the Romans maintained through war and that probably uh, even in, in the ancient Latin tradition was uh, revived along those patterns um, in, the, in the Roman conquest of the peninsula it was, uh, it was practiced. Um, the alliances, of course, are crucial here because you see essentially a essentially Latin leagues. Rome will fight against the Latins, as you know. Uh, the ethnic, this uh, Italic uh, people, about which we, we don't know uh, more than much in the in the east of Rome, because that's mostly the yes east south is the direction that Rome will first take expansionistically. Um, so we will meet now with the Aequi, with the Volsci, uh, and so on. Uh, and their territories are are important because we're talking naturally about today um, in central Italy and massively archaeologically stratified areas. Actually, the most single most archaeologically stratified in the world. There were the Romans, there, there were the medievals. There was a lot of things, right? So, but you you can literally see a lot. Um, not much of what these peoples left, but let's say what's um, these peoples as R Romans, right, as they had been elevated to that divine um, standard, at least um, making part of the hierarchy that was, um, of course, revolving around the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, and that fundamentally Rome had managed to shift from the, uh, the sanctuary of Jupiter Latiaris, and that, that uh, as you know, was... Uh, the prerogative of other Latin communities. Rome wasn't always independent. Um, there were, uh, think about Alba Longa, that at some point ruled over Rome in the very in the most archaic times. But there was this um, constant cooperation, yes, but as a consequence, constant conflict between these peoples that understood, of course, also on a broader scale, that they had to unite in order to succeed. But that were also constantly... Uh, basically at each other's throats because uh, of course if some of them became too powerful it could be as Rome would in fact would uh, would take them over and hence the, the clashes even we talk about the Battle of Suessa for example so the strange couple of the Romans and the Samnites fighting joined against the the Latins and of course of course winning but immediately quarreling and you know and we'll see now of course it also has how um, the Samnitic wars that had actually already started um, will uh, you know would end like? Um, of course, the reason of a quality of a superiority of Rome as that traditional modern blend, as uh, Rome had a tribal system essentially, but was a city at the same time, and hence the qual the, the the quality. The intrinsic quality of, of the Roman forces at this point, aside from the hero, uh, heroicizing, let's say, uh, models of the sagas, is probably correct, as these were more highly motivated people. They had more to lose. They knew how to handle better in a more hierarchical fashion. They had lots, again, of people and of resources to draw from. And they had this crystalline clear um, idea that... Uh, simply Rome would have conquered the world. So 
even any setback and it was seen as a fundamentally as an accident along the road and it was n- nothing i mean roads that were literally created as holy roads by by rome literally entering the terrors of these people that were steamrolled um sooner or later and that wouldn't in fact even probably make the romans conceive the concept of defeat even after the um the the, the, the massacre of the Cowden forks the when the the, the, the Samnites eventually ma- humiliated the Roman prisoners, making them pass under um, their, their yoke. Um, Rome v- wouldn't probably even conceive this, right? The Samnites were still thinking, if you want, maybe in a romantic chivalric idea, look, uh, we, we, we showed that you are less because we made this ritual, etc. But, you know, real power is another thing. And the, the, the same Samnites were to find that out um, the hard way, and in this sense, Rome is a bit difficult to characterize. It's, it's kind of a bull, or kind of a um, the, the 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 bullying neighbor, even that always knocks at your door, and it's simply going for it. Like in the message it brings, the Evangelium that it brings, is the is confirmed by her same victory. Right, this is the most astonishing aspect of it all. That not just Rome managed to crush these peoples, but to rule over them, and in less than a century, by the time um, Hannibal would march uh, into Italy and would uh, literally make a, a, a bloodbath of, of Roman um, nobility and, and people alike at, at Cannae and, and beyond, these Italic peoples stuck with. Rome, right? And not just because of fear of, you know, that that she would punish them, uh, because the Roman, uh, or the Romano-Italic Confederacy was exactly in the alliance itself, the Schwerpunkt of Rome. And if that had been broken, if these peoples had bailed out of the alliance, Rome could, could have not recovered. So these peoples had absolutely the decisive power at that point to overthrow Rome and they stuck with her on purpose because they were supporting her like hell. And that's probably way more impressive uh, also in terms of of sheer moral impact um, on Hannibal than the the, the massacre of Cannae uh, really was for the Romans. And that's when you could... It, you could literally see the Imperium being, um, you know, transcendentally manifested in the in the holding of the alliance system and of the eventual Roman uh, comeback, right? And to to a state that would become imperial in scale, not just because Scipio brought the war in Spain and in Africa, but because that colonial rule of the Romano-Italic Confederacy on foreign countries would fundamentally remain uh, for good, right, in in, in Roman history. Um, And uh, with all the uh, further scale of success that you know is essentially starting to take off, really, um, at that point. Um, This is, um, we will see also lots of about the Punic Wars, because the clash between Rome and Carthage provides with the best, of course, symbol of the Uranic and Catonic opposition. It's not just by reading the Aeneid uh, per se, uh, but really, probably in the in the features of of Roman and Punic culture that are, are worth pointing out. This is, however, far away in the future from what uh, from where we are now. Um, so, during the 5th century BC, all the Roman campaigning, with only a few isolated exceptions, took place actually in a rather circumscribed area around the Urbs and the Latin plain. Because Rome at this point hadn't provided herself yet with a military system that uh, could provide the resources for a prolonged campaigning uh, 
uh, in fact beyond the the Roman district, as it would become instead in the in the following century. And the reason being again that the feudal clans were not yet interested in such um, in such power compaction. We're still thinking essentially that they could make it on their own. There are dramatic showdowns such as the massacre of the uh, Gens Fabia um, in in the in the north of Rome against the Etruscans. When, as you know, these again fanatic um, uh, warrior nobility gets themselves exterminated by the the enemies, not to give ground. These possessions that, in fact, they had personally, they held personally, privately, beyond a sense of statehood. Right, even in, of course in the Roman district and in this frontier. So this tells you what Rome actually was right at the time, um, and that gradually must start to be changed because not just of examples like those that would wipe out almost completely uh, the Fabi, for example, um, but because the same thing could happen with Rome herself, right? And um, the at, at that point the, the senators were not willing. To, to, to give power to to confer say imperial magistracies to the plebs right they didn't need their manpower they were just artists and craftsmen they lived within the city gates they they of course supported already uh, by some degree the the nobility because they ruled um, you know they, they lived in the same place the nobility controlled the various parts of Rome and so on but um, nobody had had such a concentrated power to essentially put together an army that could, as from the 4th century BC, the Romans would essentially send, um, the, be sent to also in different armies, telling the truth, um, at hundreds of kilometers of distance and uh, having it maintained for that prolonged use and so already in, entailing the end of seasonalism and the, the kicking in of professionalism that, in fact, has nothing to do with uh, Marius, per se, already existed since the siege of Vey, and I will never end my crusade to, you know, uh, to to debunk how much the Marian reform didn't actually change anything from a military point of view. It was just a political reform, as a matter of fact, and all the technicalities were there since centuries in the Roman arm. Um, this is another thing. Um, however, this scale of action is exactly the one that we discuss when we think about feudal Rome, right? Because also the clients were all kind of fragmented. They didn't want to spend individually too too much. They were just hoping to take each other out or and or to, uh, let's say, to, to, to reach an hegemonic uh, position. Naturally, as as you know, in, in Roman history, this senatorial order would remain fundamentally egalitarian within each other. It wouldn't be until the first century BC like a single Gens, like the Yuli in that case, it would manage to take over Rome as a monarchy. Right. So this was a um, a character of the Latins, for example, that were significantly less politically vertical and socially stratified than, say, the Etruscans. In other words, they were more warlike, right? But they were also powerful and rich, and they were becoming more hierarchical enough again to um, maintain that perfect balance arguably uh, that would make um, the Roman army as we know it possible. Um, what were the main opponents of the Romans at this point? Well you have uh, essentially the southern Etruscans. Etruscans you know are these peoples of disputed origin that was probably much more autochthonous than it's usually credited because we're at the end of the day when we talk about peoples you're just talking about elites right the moment of great migrations had been over right etruria as you know was very open to to trade to the mediterranean um they in fact their center was roughly around today's tuscany that was the so-called the the capitalist the stretch also far in the Po valley then the celts arrived and things changed there, but in the south, they stretch uh, along. In fact, the, the Tyrrhenian coast, including Rome, is pretty close to the sea. But also the Campanian coastlines, even some Hellenic polis, because the, or that say centers that would be eventually realized uh, that naturally existed in these lands of ancient uh, ur- urbanization, right? At 
we're talking about very primitive times still, right? These are roughly the same times in which the in fact of the Persian Wars. Um and they're you know in, in Hellas their hand being a kind of a millinery civilization of some kind. Italy was again something between that and say Central Europe, um, if you can put it this way. And the Etruscans were pretty advanced. I mean everybody knows of course how um in fact, uh, influential their culture, uh, c- certain suggestions of their religion, even among the plebs, with the Etruscan kings were meant to have uh, ruled over Rome, which again means that these were somehow some some condottieri that had managed to gemonize, um, control, like su- supported by some clans rather than others in the city and so on. So um, something there, even less kind of categorically distinct distinguishable than, than we think. But at least in the Roman sagas, the concept that this Etruscan presence had been there and that um, it had at some point essentially betrayed the sacred standards um, of, of the Latins uh, brought to, to the fact of the overthrow and eventually this moment of crisis to which the Romans uh, reacted by putting together their forces and starting uh, their uh, conquest uh, of the world would have lasted uninterruptedly for 400 years. Um, now, the the Etruscans. Nobody. We, we talk about the the, the capitals, but nobody really knows which were exactly the 12 Etruscan cities. Um, I mean, some we know, of course, and were important. In, Rome lay basically on the southern edge of Etruria because basically everything um, on the right bank of the Tiber River was Etruscan. So literally parts of Rome today, in fact the Trastevere area, the Trans-Tiber one, was Etruria. There were Etruscan merchants, there were their, their colonies, they traded with the Latins, they, of course there was the river that was close to the salt mines and, and the mouth uh, on the Tyrrhenian. Uh, that was exported uh, in Sabine, in the, in the Apennine, the, the continental interland. Um, and um, it was a pretty thriving era, very fertile and rich, and so on. And, of course, such Etruscan proximity, in the first place, had brought to some attrition. Um, and the main Etruscan city here, at least in, in the clash against Rome, was, famously enough, Vey, a city with with which Rome struggled for control over of the same Tiber River, right? Until uh, they's destruction at the hand of Camillus, Furius Camillus in 396 BC, which is the moment in which, in fact, the Romans allegedly took the next step. Camillus is a very debated figure. Um, but uh, some some people want to see an historicity in him, and it is true that everything that was written in Rome before, say, the 70s of the 3rd century BC is between myth and history, right? Because that's how they literally thought things were. I mean, these figures were not just random people. They were literal heroes that had managed to enter in consonance by an important degree with the, the divine order, and they were carrying out prodigies as far as also this of course the divine, the God given Holy Ghost, the Imperium what was concerned. The destruction of they was already a, a pretty uh, gloomy prediction of the again incredibly brutal but at the same time pragmatic world view that can hardly be in fact assessed with the same capacity of risk uh, assessment uh, you know uh, cost benefits, in fact, um, of realization. Um, and that in the siege of they opened exactly to that level of professionalism we were hinting at before, because the siege of they is the, um, in fact, the, the, the moment which allegedly the Roman uh, soldiers were provided with a salarium, uh, a stipendium, as a matter of fact, um, and the term miles, in fact, so as you know, the the warrior, the the soldier, comes exactly from the fact that he was paid a millet at the siege of Bay. 
Um, so what does this mean even in between the myth and history? Of course, is that uh, the Roman army was large enough now through the so-called Camillian reform that in fact Camillus is credited for for him, you know, having surpassed um, an important fact, um, you know, uh, anachronism of so of the feudal army, also tactical of course, organization and supply was again. Um, um, carried out with a um, massive um, amount of centralized resources, right? So, final army could be supplied by um, an organized state that was willing, right, to to invest those resources to crush Rome's enemies and incredibly growing throughout the time because the more Again, the expansion succeeded, and naturally, the more resources were accessible, and naturally rich uh, was Italy as much as politically fragmented, and what a better uh, target right, for such an ambitious and voracious power uh, like the Roman one had been forming through, um, in fact, such synchrosis of senatorial and popular power. Uh, realized, carried out also through an awareness of what we could call easily a Clausewitzian um, dimension, right? A, a first person that is the reason, that is the government embodied by the senators, so with the traditional wisdom. Um, the, the risk for gamble, for what you cannot uh, avoid um, in war in the first place, but that you cannot properly um, do without uh, if you are um, if you are to evoke in fact those uh, forces that you are which are the same enemy ones that you are provoking right but there also are your inner demons that you have to be able to tame and that if you do not confront you will you will never be able to to surpass it will just be divorced from right um, and of course the blind uh, violence, the primordial hatred um, of the people, right? That, as uh, vulgarly disordered and chaotic and anarchic it is, is brutally disciplined in one of the most radically traumatic ways that can be described in the history of mankind to be transformed, essentially, in fact, from Italic warriors or peasant farmers of some kind with that, you know, bias for, for bloodshed, of course. Um, in such hybrid reality um, into our Roman legionnaire as we have come to know it, right? Today we will not talk about tactics, etc. But you know that um, these dates are not just um, anecdotal, at least. The the Camillian reform occurred, especially from a tactical point of view, seemingly between the, um, the sack of Rome that would occur traditionally after they... Um, and the essentially the 40s, the 30s, let's say, by the time of the Libyan, so-called Libyan Legion, um, because it's described by Levy during the, the Samnitic Wars, um, and or at least in between them, and that is essentially the Manipular Legion, right? So something very different from the original so-called Phalanx, not because it was anything like the Hellenic classical one, but because it was, again, this single battle line of heavy infantry somehow segmented in with, with, with the best elements in the front and the softer ones in, in the rear that um, didn't have reserves like the manipular one. It was instead on three battle lines and that had been an important element of, in, in the defeat, in the crushing defeat that the Romans had suffered against the Gauls. Um at the Battle of the Alia River, because they, it, it was enough just to, to make it collapse as a single line, right, by outflanking it, and then, you know, the entire Roman army would be uh, destroyed, right? Um, the, uh, but continuing with the main enemies of Rome here, there were already the Aequi, which were, um, said, a hill tribe living in the Aniene Valley above Tibur and Praeneste, Today, these are almost basically the outskirts of Rome. Um, but they were kind of more, kind of, in fact, 
more but a hybrid between uh, the the Aqui were not Latins, by the way. They were they were another branch of these Halic peoples. Uh, we know very few about them, telling the truth, just because uh, they fought several wars with Rome, and then eventually we see stuff coming from the places that they inhabited. But just when the Romans had taken them over, and there is hardly anything kind of distinctive about them for us to to understand how it could be um, in in that time. Um, these peoples tendentially were. Like the, the Latins were settled in this great plain. In fact, they, they were called Latins because the, the term comes from Latin, means white in in in, in Latin. In fact, um, and it, it, we don't know what the original names of these Indo-European peoples really was. They migrated and they took the name of the land. Um, these other populations instead were more mm, barbaric, if you want. They they were more like mountaineers, they lived in this Apenninic hills, and they were always seeking, naturally, from their kind of more primitive, uh, primitively motivated um, um, military style to swarm in the plains and settling on the best lands, right? So they, they were, generally speaking, a threat. Um, and, uh, in fact, their f- the, the egg one, uh, frequent sorties, out of the mountains threatened uh, those um, aforementioned towns, Tibur and Praeneste, um, in particular, but also northern Latium in general. So with great um, distress of uh, the Romans and their capacity of pacifying their, their district, um, maintaining it secure, making Properly, the alliance not just between the, you know, with with their allies, but also the one between the the senators and and the people. Uh, right. And most menacing of all, but more distant, were another people, a Sabellian tribe, the Volsci. Right. These were Oscans. So they were the other. Actually, the major branch of the Italic peoples scattered across the, the Apennine, um, and that were based in the mountains of the Liri slash Garigliano Valley and the Lepinian Mountains. Now, the Romans had very interesting takes on these peoples because, as we'll see now, the only ones uh, she actually um, considered as possibly threatening, you know especially from a later perspective um, in time, because these wars actually were pretty straining for, for Rome herself. Um, the, the, only, uh, the only challenge that they thought they had met were, were the Samnites in Italy, right? The, the others, Rome said, these are not basically up to, especially our military standards, right? But the, the Volscians seems to have been particularly wild, Right. Uh, in the early 5th century, they had descended into the Latin plain uh, and had overrun the land between Tarrachina and Ardea on the coast, from which they posed a constant threat to the Latin states, especially on the lower slopes of the Alban hills, and from there to Roman territory uh, beyond. Right, The Alban hills is kind of volcanic reliefs that shelter Rome, especially in the southeast, right? And so those were pretty interesting areas um, as far as frontier warfare uh, is concerned. Uh, but the Volsci could um, put together right, consistent forces to even uh, go across that boundary, and thus they were quite of a torn in the side uh, for Rome. Um, the tribal alliance of Romans, Latins, and Hernicans um, would meet with considerable success anyway. Rome had become increasingly preeminent in it, right? This pressure brought on Latium had somehow favored the same, not just the alliance, but of course the, the rise of Rome as a major, just not political military and social center, but just as a, you know, as the strategic and 
logistical um, hub for all, all the allies. But from the Seven Hills, the Romans could definitely control uh, an incredibly important area of, of the Latin plain, fundamentally extending their hegemony gradually on it, um, and becoming the, the true leaders of such an alliance. In 390, as we know, Rome was suddenly sacked by a band of marauding Gauls that came from uh, the Adriatic Sea in central northern Italy, the Senones, right? Um, that would form actually, eventually, the the territories of uh, the northernmost limit of the Romano-Italic Confederacy, even though they were partly Gallic, as you understand. We'll talk about them. We can insert them in in our um, Celtic uh, peoples series. Um, this um, inevitably meant that the Roman campaigning over the next few years uh, continued to be limited to this same constricted area, because, um, as you know, the Celts couldn't quite, right? Uh, they were just like a an army um, band of some sort, right? They they were traveling. Some say that. It was Dionysus of Syracuse that had sent these goals against Rome. That was already the kind of the realization that this this Latin power was emerging um, to a degree that seemed quite um, uh, quite concerning, because Rome was thus also entering just uh, the, she she was not much of a you know of any relevant naval power at this point. There were expeditions in Sardinia at some point. Um, but, uh, you know, Rome is not really a maritime force here. So, but the, the fact still that she controlled an important part of the coast that was increasing also in just in economic weight, what was felt in the um, in the Tyrrhenian uh, Sea as far as Sicily, and, you know, the Romans were already kind of becoming noticeable, right? Especially of uh, after this extraordinary... Um, military uh, accomplishments that uh, had brought them to, to conquer Bay, now to actually as a consequence of, of, of the Gallic, but here the chronology again is, uh, can be blurred, but evidently Rome had already been thinking of some military change in a more organized fashion aside from the, the Celtic shock and, and, and so on. Um, between 389 and 359 um, the Romans are involved also in wars that had been somehow unleashed by the same vulnerability that Latium had um, showed at the time of the Gallic invasion. Um, thus, uh, the Latins and the Herdniki had become fundamentally enemies. Right? They, they realized that if they had any hope to escape uh, this uh, Roman black hole right, by the sheer uh, gravity, um, of of the herbs, uh, they had to act at at that point, right? And they were somehow doomed in in a Roman perspective. But there is no doubt that they um, they they still had uh, some cards to play at, at that point. In on, on this occasion, the Romans marched against Satricum, Antium, and also the Volsci of the Pomptine Plain. In 389 and 386, uh, Rome fights against the Etruscans, amongst whom Faleri was doubtless the um, most preeminent uh, center, at least as far as the, um, the Roman frontier was concerned. It would be only in the next 15 years that Roman influence began to spread uh, beyond Latium and culminating in the fatal alliance with Capua in 343 and the subsequent uh, first Samnitic war. This is crucial because you realize that Rome passed the test also you know, standing on her feet and not just the allies. She has managed to secure uh, Latin power and uh, other 
uh, Italic cities, Capua specifically, that was, um, you know, an ancient um, colony, right, of non-Italic origin, but was settled by the Oscan peoples of, of the Apennines that taken over, right, and, and were, um, however, incapable of, of controlling power from the Samnitic pressure in the interland, and thus they called the Romans for help because they were objectively now some of, again, the, the, the most power, definitely the most powerful people in um, in Italy. Um, it's um, it would it would be anecdotal to stress now all the um, enormous amount of resources Rome already controlled uh, just by securing securing Latium, right? So one can just appreciate it with a better you know analysis of all the uh, say the, the the territory that Rome now already controlled but securing also the the uh, the Apenninic, um foothills and uh having pushed against the the Etruscans further and having began to, to sub open to even a, a more maritime dimension as you know Capua was again very well um uh, inserted in that kind of international maritime traffic, also with, uh, in fact, with Magna Graecia, with, with Sicily and, and beyond, right? So it, now Rome was really entering an, another stage of her history. And it's also one that we can start appreciating, not just from Levy, that definitely is basing itself on a historical tradition, right? There are doubts about lots of things. Um, even the, you know, the, the actual existence of, say, specific Samnitic war, for example. But most modern historiography agrees that there is an important historical base to it. Things can be mm, simplified. Um, there are definitely some uh, scenes that are just inserted for the sake of literary entertainment, uh, modeled out of, say, Thucydides' um, dialogues of the Peloponnesian War and so on. Um, however, uh, the uh, most important source that we start appreciating here in a more kind of also uh, secular mindset that definitely the, the Romans didn't have at this point is Polybius, right? I, I just mentioned Thucydides because in that um, comparison we uh, I, I just made uh, about um, Levy essentially drawing from the, Pel the Peloponnesian War some you know, passages about the dialogue between uh, diplomats, representatives, etc., you realize that in Thucydides there is a, um, a rationalization, like the causes of the war are very, let's say, uh, kind of material, even, right, and uh, illustrated like that. Levy, that still writes from the 1st century BC, not the 4th, um, Instead, as a typical Roman, reasons morally, right? The, the reasons why Rome has to intervene. It, it, it's about, you know, uh, you know, the moral superiority. It's about the sacred. It's about religion. And this is how, it, considered that in Livius' times, of course, the Romans had somehow secularized in, in mindset. In fact, they were distant from the, the, the actual memory of the past. They were discussing, but they were still deeply ingrained with this completely different mentality for which militarily, um, and you can see it from Levy himself when he talks about, in fact, 4th century BC warfare, that um, properly there is the, the absolute realization from a Roman side that you must force it, and I made a video about this in, in, for the Roman, Celtic, and Germanic religion, must be virtus next to discipline. Whereas Thucydides rationalized the thing and says just discipline basically is, is capable of winning wars alone. That's how much, let's say, the, the thought had, um, let's say, uh, in fact, modernized without taking into account tradition in the Atlantic world. And that, that, that is impressive by scale if you compare the two, um, the two dialogues, right? So... Uh, the virtus in a Roman sense is not just the sum of all the other virtus, but is properly the military, the virile, in fact, um, s sacral 
view of the world. It's it's actually not different. I made a video about the Indo-European sacred fury. Um, with the same concept of furor, there are two different etymologies the Romans use it in different ways, but it, it's essentially the same thing. It, it's that kind of wisdom that is transcendentally, kind of exoterically, um, mystically felt, right? And not just pure rationale. Actually, the rationale stems from it, eventually, as after having experienced these um, uh, these capacities. Um, and there must be a balance between the two things that the Romans were identifying, exactly, in that reason. It's the reason why they could prevail, say, over the Gauls and other peoples that were still mostly about. They couldn't centralize, they couldn't rationalize, they couldn't statalize, and therefore they just relied essentially on a mystical approach. And this is something that um, Vegetius, still in the 4th century, was A.D., was uh, so 800 years later, was pointing out, in spite of the kind of uh, already at that time the Byzantinization and somehow also the, the Hellenization of thought, even though Rome had also ingrained in that culture the the importance of the virtus, um, and so as what Vegetius calls a sort of military science of sort that is, however, deeply imbued with that kind of moral sense and not just essentially a technical discipline that you can simply apply without any kind of war likeness, right? And this is dramatically close as a Roman awareness, and I made a video about this also in the video about the Fortuna Kaiseris, to the, to the close of its in theory, telling the truth, because it realizes that uh, the, the, the best way to, to fight is the full optimization of the three elements of the of the Clausewitzian Trinity, so the ones we were pointed out before, um, and that require uh, a deep moral convention, a deep spirituality, something that no people today has the painless idea of what it is, um, especially the ones that, you know, uh, pretend that war is to be won without kind of a of a of a balance, culturally speaking, and this is the the actual problem, right? Especially after, you know, communism, after a complete lack of any trace of human dignity of of, of any possible form, um, and so uh, having almost completely accomplished the process of completely emptying of any human trace of, of human civil, uh, of you know civilization of mankind. Um, the world was gradually degenerating at the time as well, but those things were pretty well known to these peoples, and it's remarkable how uh, we can reconstruct, in the sense, how the Romans thought comparatively to others in order to explain their, their rise as well as the universal power. Um, so Polybius naturally uh, approaches the matter from also defeated, uh, just for those who say uh, history is written by the winners. Well, ask Polybius, ask Flavius Josephus, and, you know, just stop saying bullshit, please, because nobody needs it. Um, and it, it naturally analyzes the thing from, as we were just saying, kind of a more rationalizing perspective. It's not entirely so, because uh, Polybius is not to say that it is. He is more Hellenistic in, in mindset. And so he has seen something else as far as the Macedons are concerned, for example, and so always remember that at this point in history, um, uh, at least the one that Polybius was writing, not uh, the 4th century BC when the thing literally happened, Macedonia, of course, had taken over the world. And so everybody was kind of pointing out, well, who's the next one? Right? This is an important idea. It's, it, it's as if you know the world has always been hegemonized by one power, and suddenly you have to explain why another emerges, um, assuming it does, right? So in, at, at that point, the Romans had accomplished that in a way that also the previous one had not done differently from today, where you can have, you know, some hegemonies, but um, uh, one after the other, but they're always more disappointing than another, right? So there is no one that is, you know, even on the horizon, looking like, a, you know, something different from a portion of the dignity of mankind. Um, and that's what we have become, obviously, now, for many reasons. And again, there is no hope uh, for anyone, uh, at least um, as far as the, the main 
um, political, military and social indicators in the world are the ones we're currently experiencing. Um, and uh, Pol Polybius mostly appreciates, of course, the imperialistic perspective of Rome, not just because he was writing for, for the Roman elite, but um, because he was fascinated as a Greek about this, this in fact, uh, spiritual revival that was trying to rationalize, also probably because he had to present Rome to a world that was reasoning mostly like him, because, you know, the, the, the Greeks and, and their literature was naturally the, the only one <laughs> arguably existing, in the historiographic, at least in a modern sense, and Polybius, like, if you read him, you say, well, this is a guy you could speak to today. I mean, he literally thinks like me, and that's how much also we are children of the Greeks um, in intellectually, and not only for the best, but still, right, we, we can, and that's the reason why we should appreciate um, the, mm, the, the take on Rome that especially Polybius has, right? Uh, we will not talk about this now, because it's a huge topic, it deserves many other videos on their own. Mm, however, it's, it's worth appreciating how the author was essentially trying to, to describe how Rome had transformed himself from the, the, being the, the, the mistress of Italy to the dominant power in the world Mediterranean. Um, and uh, as it was profiling to, to become even more, I mean, at, at that point, historically, the, the entire center was the Mediterranean. Right, uh, continental Europe was, in, first of all, depending on it, but still somehow peripheral. It's just Augustus that would give, properly, you know, in a geographical sense, a, uh, a European dimension to the Roman Empire, right, or to settle it um, for good and build the consequences that we know. And objectively, is nothing short of of amazing what Rome accomplished. Uh, between 343 and 264 BC. Uh, the, the domination of Italy, de facto, and uh, the consolidation of that uh, political uh, confederacy that would uh, last in a unitary sense to, in fact, taking off right, for conquering the, the rest of the world. Uh, this is one of the most crucial and overlooked and underappreciated and unpopularized topics of the entire Roman history, warfare, culture, and beyond. Um, this period we just um, highlighted, it's just, as you understand, 70 years, not even, right? Um, and despite also the 25 years of uneasy and intermittent peace between uh, the Romans and the Samnites we were just mentioning Suessa before because of the Latin wars, etc., was dominated, in fact, by the clash with the Samnites, which are equally kind of underrepresented, underappreciated, and somehow misunderstood, right? How did the uh, Romans and the Samnites uh, differ? Well, to make the long story short, as we've seen, Rome was essentially a, a city-state, Right and was keeping to evolve in that direction, albeit as a properly territorial domination, right? And basically becoming hegemonic in a sort of sort of, say, transposing the the previous internal feudal order to to a larger scale, where Rome basically uh, dominates on a set of other peoples of other. And there were other kind of cities, towns, villages, settlements, tribes, you know. Um, that uh, thus in, in Italy took did take this very in fact gradual shade depending on on the areas like naturally the coastal ones were more urbanized richer uh, Italy uh, say central and southern Italy have very few coastal plains telling the truth um, and uh, this means that as we will see now most of these wars were fought in the interland right it wasn't like people say ah oh, this is I don't know, because of the influence of, of, of the Greeks, or, you know, it's talking mostly a Mediterranean thing. How Rome expands is notoriously, because, um, you know, the, the Romans were landlubbers, fundamentally. Um, 
they continentally right it's this uh, mostly apenninic uh, interland populated by italic tribes that makes properly the body and soul of the in fact uh, romano italic confederacy right and the samnites are the most representative of these peoples because they are essentially the best of the oscans as we've seen the oscans run just like this population from central southern italy um uh, across the apennine right there were other populations like in the southeast were also of illyrian descent there were uh, as we've seen in the center from the Iranian side the uh, latino faliscans then in the north you have the umbrians and you you don't have of course there are approximations that were somehow similar that these were all um except the illyrians and uh, italics right then you had the etruscans there are another thing in the north there are the celts and other um at that point celticized populations such as the the Veneti, for example that we don't understand whether they were italics or illyrians or whatever and it probably doesn't even make any sense to to ask the question in that regard and the samnites are essentially highlanders like they live in the uh, apenninic plateaus they're cattle breeders. They're pretty warlike. They have um, essentially a confederal profile themselves. That, however, differently from Rome, that has one of the most systematically, brutally um, imperialistic, um, subjugational mindset and capacities imaginable. They are based on a concept of um, essentially of shared pastures of kind of autonomy. Of, um, it's kind of, a, of a traditional sense of themselves, but respecting each other's uh, identities, rights, and not overstepping, right? And having this kind of common, also sacrality, there is the, the legal in theater. There are some interesting, also, uh, archaic military practice that we will look at, especially as far as the Vers Sacrum also was, was, in, was involved. We've seen that the Samnite wars start because it's these peoples from tribes from the interland that pressure the the Oscans that had managed to gemonize some coastal centers um, in the Tyrrhenian um, and the Samnites as a consequence are kind of a bit more barbaric tribal and warlike than what the same Romans are naturally the Romans already at this point find with a, a consistent amount of allies that make up substantially for a health or actually more of their armies right there are the roman legions the full blooded roman citizens let's say from the agar romanos that we will talk about in a while because colonies were already being founded so the romans are just replicating themselves as other little romes around but these other peoples were either the latins that had a right on their own there were other allies it, 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 the various federa were very very uh, heterogeneous, right? It, it, it all reflected how these peoples had historically interacted with Rome and whether they had fought previously or not. I mean, you know, their political balance, right? So there's nothing fully homogeneous. We will have to make a video, however, to at, at least explain the categories and the shades of Roman citizenship, especially at this time. Um, the... Um, the Samnites instead live dwell in a properly in a world on their own, right? They don't have also much um, of a further kind of imperial territorial ambition, also because they probably hardly have their the the, the tools to achieve that, right? They have settlements, centers. Boyanum, for example, was the most important one, but it was mostly like a a place where all the Samnitic representatives would gather and take joint decisions which as you understand is still a long way to go civilizationally than say um, urban and still tribal but importantly urban clans that share the control in a single city the largest in latium and that already are you know acquainted with you know such refined civilization like the etruscan one so like Rome had fundamentally come about. And um, this, in perspective, like the, the word chance, this were the, the Samnites were the only people that could 
actually um, stop the Roman conquest, right? They could have defeated Rome. They could have broken her, as we will see now, especially also with the help of other peoples. They could do it, right? So dominating the, the, the Samnium was a bit the Schwerpunkt of Italy in many ways, and that's what the Romans really meant when they said that the Samnites were the only ones that they, they respected, essentially, as not as peers, because Rome was unavoidably superior to everybody else, but that they they appreciated, right, as not much as the, the myth of the good savage, because at this point we're also somehow similar still, but it's a recurrent theme, right, in, in the Roman historiography, also for what we were saying before in comparison with the Atlantic one, that instead, you know, would never kind of say, oh, look, a barbarian, they, they, they you know, they're kind of wild, but th there is some good in them, at least, no, like, for the Greeks, there is just the Greeks, and the rest of the world literally does not exist, right, or and or it's rubbish, right? It, the Romans had a completely different mindset, and this would be to be appreciated by, again, uh, snotty kids today to say, oh, but the Romans, so the others were barbarians, they were racist, and actually, you know, hiding very often racism of the people who whined like that themselves. Um, no, the, the Romans, for anybody who has studied even, you know, um, Latin literature since um, primary school perfectly knows uh, from from Caesar, from Tactus, from many others that they were pretty damn interested in tribal peoples and that they actually liked them and that there's, if anything, a positive bias um, towards some populations was were probably, of course, not liked by the Romans, literally, but it was functional to showing kind of the establishment, what kind of standards, especially the the, the, the senatorial um, class wanted things to, to still be back in his high, which would have been actually less uh, powerfully, say, politically compact. And so it's uh, the Romans are actually making a favor to some of the peoples that they dealt with in, the, in those terms. So here we are at, at the level of complete disorientation, um, in, in any form of, of moral compass imaginable, right? We are, have arrived to the point in which Western civilization can literally not read itself anymore just because we are too ignorant to the point that it's zero, right? Um, um, let's skip this aspect because I could say terrible things otherwise. Um, the... The Samnitic Wars are interesting for a number of reasons, um, also from a strictly military point of view. Many people think that the, the wars in this terrible, ragged terrain of the Apennine interland somehow favored the uh, Roman flexibility from a tactical point. That's another load of, you know, if, if you just make this statement, it means that you properly have never studied military history in your life. Um, there is no doubt that the Samnitic Wars helped, right, uh, developing the Roman army, also because there were ferocious wars, there were threats of mutinies also from, from the Roman soldiery to, to fight in such faraway places in such a prolonged way against such courageous enemies and so on, but the Roman determination there was, again, brutal and the, the, the Roman establishment wouldn't accept anything but victory, right, so, and that's how it, it really happened, um, aside from a tactical, of course, superiority that Rome boasted, the Samnites mostly preferred ambushes right in their um, homeland, also just because they were strategically on the defensive and so on, but in open field, they were, you know, somehow reluctant, right, to just uh, meet with with the Roman legions, because they knew that they were risking too much in the first place. They, they, their warfare at this point didn't differ dramatically, as we've seen in the video about the spears and the javelins. But it was still significantly different as far as the political cohesion of these peoples was concerned, right? The Romans were definitely more compact, more drilled, more disciplined, and were becoming so. Not just in, in the way that they would become later to the same level, but becoming so, right? Um, still by the... I don't know, the, the, the Pyrrhic Wars, Roman, the Roman legion was not able to perform um, 
you know, outflanking maneuver, things like that, uh, if not accidentally, right? And um, it's, you have to await for the Second Punic War to have a probably a fully professional army, right? And uh, as it would remain, de facto, I mean, before the, well before the Marian reforms, right? The, the point here was projecting all the Latin resources across Italy, and that uh, took resources, but also, and especially, order, a form, right? Uh, um, you know, a political will. Um, and the Romans displayed it splendidly, right? And in spite of the difficulties. And so, definitely, the Samnitic Wars were a great test, um, but there is hardly anything here that you can uh, reconnect with, with a with a say technical or tactical dimension just per se right it's moral force and as we've seen the romans were definitely aware of that again these people's vote with pretty similar equipment so also for people who claim i don't know because the romans had i don't know the combination of the scutum or the pilum and the gladius um yeah because you know the old the the, uh, the other italic peoples didn't have that instead right you know uh well I, I will not comment on this. But um, as it emerges clearly from the various examples of devotiones, uh, in, especially during the Samnitic Wars, and, but also beyond, um, you realize that the Romans were struggling against to transform the Italic warrior in a Roman legionnaire. Right? So, discipline, again, this um, undissolvable moral force that is, of course, a divine nature and that makes uh, the defeated essentially a, uh, a goner in a, in, in a metaphysical sense, not just in a biological one, um, is at the center of the whole thing. There is, in other words, nothing uh, more than Rome. Um, there is a destiny to fulfill and the virtus must exist, but it must be disciplined as well. And discipline and virtus cannot exist without each other. Yet this discipline had been unknown in the previous centuries as probably the tactical technicality that the Romans started to toy, in fact, with during the 4th century BC. And the Romans needed to enforce it, right, on, again, a, a cultural substratum that was quite heroic, individualistic, tribal, barbaric of some, some sort. Um, we'll talk more about this tactical update, um, which, of course, was important, don't get me wrong, um, but it, it was just a necessity for how, you know, also the enemy was fighting like, and not quite just, uh, you know, an extra gear that simply allowed the Romans to win uh, without anything else, right? And uh, the, um, the situation of so the Samnitic Wars required such constant moral support because um, we, again, we have mostly the Libyan uh, version that um, probably skips some aspect of, of, of this all. Say, uh, probably the Romans and the Samnites began to fight uh, almost by accident, right? Because you couldn't quite tell in this Apenninic frontier, who's who, which bands belong to Rome sometimes at least the Romans have now a, a, a unified control but still what they do as individual generals and uh, political lines it, is important it has to do still with a kind of a clinic background um, now the, the first uh, Samnitic war was fought traditionally between 343 and 341 it was somehow small affair provoked by Rome's involvement in Campania, as we've seen. The, the big one was the second, right? Uh, fought between uh, 327 and 304. So more than 20 years of war, which is definitely one of those contexts from which military cultures are forged in a broader sense. Um, if anything, if, if something technical was kind of more soundly introduced at this point as definitely the aforementioned tree of, of, of Scutum, Gladius and Pilum is concerned was because of, you know, tactical needs, not because they were, you know, the thing that had made tactics as people actually believe, right? You know, that 
technology makes tax, it's not true, right? It's it's absolutely minority and never determinant uh, in warfare, as a matter of fact. So that simply emerged as functionality. And of, in fact, it owed much from the same Semnitic equipment, by the way, uh, that was habituated to that also degree of... Um, in fact, the say, in individualism. Not that the Romans wouldn't have it, but that's also how the Roman legionnaire becomes, right? A hybrid between kind of, in, say, in, uh, individualistic and discipline at the same time. The, the Roman legionnaire can find, can fight also alone, whatever the situation is. Um, and definitely in such a war made often by guerrilla skirmishes, excruciating fights on incredibly nightmarish terrain just you know ask anyone who has ever fought in Italy historically like you know it's just a freaking ballet after another right so it's it's a nightmare of a very strategist and in that that sh tests and shows what what actually Rome was made of right and how much will was there to turn the tide and to break the mold in the, consider the Semnites were finding their home, right? The, the, the Romans planned this and succeeded, and succeeded for good. This is the interesting thing. It's true that the Semnites will keep rebelling until the, you know, the social war, but um, de facto they were within Rome, and there was really nowhere that they could really go uh, after, especially the, the beginning of the third century uh, BC. Uh, and the Second Samnite War was essentially a grim duel for supremacy in central and southern Italy, right? So among the Italics, um, as we were explaining before, the Samnitic Confederacy was uh, the most powerful entity in Italy after Rome, and crushing it meant that all the other peoples, tribes, um, communities would have sooner or later fallen under this you know, systematically subjugating uh, force uh, that Rome had created. During the Third Samnitic War, 298-291, um, and what should perhaps be called the Fourth, there is a debate about whether we're talking about three or four wars in 284-272, the Samnites that had been significantly, you know, broken already by the, this um, exhausting Roman hammering, participated in coalitions which tried, albeit in vain, to stop the Romans dominating the whole peninsula. Right. Um, we will talk about this later, but consider that Rome was not just simply you know, going back and forth from Rome, again, was colonizing the space, was integrating it, tying it, in fact, Romanizing it, um, in ways that here are um, not what you can usually explain, like, you know, Romanization, that uh, they, they were copying, they were obliging other people to be Romans. How do you actually imagine it to be, right? This is a matter of conviction. We explain it countless times. If you lose, because you give ground, you cannot make the point of saying, you know, well, I still disagree, because if you actually think to be right, and you, what's at stake is, is your liberty and, um, and future, you just can't, um, you know, w what's the point of leaving, even, um, in that condition otherwise? It's just like the, the complaint of the weak that says, uh, you know, but who rules me is bad, and well, you don't understand that they have proved to be civilizationally superior to you just because you even stop fighting. Right, and these peoples here were not even just easy quitters, let me tell you, as they were probably some of the most courageous populations inhabiting the Mediterranean, um, viciously forged in continuous guerrilla um, raids, skirmishes. I mean, something you really don't want to know if you had been there, right? Probably the, the, then you, you understand what kind of experience the Roman military acquired throughout these generations, because must have been, you know, terrifying just to enter the Samnitic interland. Uh, cold, mountainous, um, you know, inhospitable in, in many ways, right? And, and yet Rome went there too, 
right? This is because they they had realized that it, without that, they they would have always just belated the problem and made it bigger, right? So in this l latter phase, in which there is the Battle of Centinum in 295, we will see it now. It's this huge coalition of all basically Italian peoples against Rome. Um, it, uh, in fact, the orbs manages to to crash um, any resistance and to dominate the, the entire uh, peninsula, right? Uh, naturally, the, mm, the 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 two blocks, right, which is perhaps uh, inaccurate to, to to speak of in these terms, but however, during the the peak of the conflict, um, must have seemed evenly matched, right? As we were saying, uh, the the, the Samnites did have the potential to thwart Roman expansionism. Because after all, Rome was, yes, very resourceful, morally, materially, as we've seen, but it still mm, uh, controlled a limited territory, right? Uh, Italy was importantly populated, right? And also resourceful. I mean, also the Samnites had their own resources, after all, at least the ones that could allow them to prosecute the war. Um, and this... Um, Italic um, Apenninic interland felt enough in common, not just anti-Roman hatred, to um, stand their ground in a more or less united way. Right? Uh, Rome um, arguably had an advantage actually on this ground because, as we've seen, it was much more politically cohesive. That's how you actually win wars um, most of the times. Um, and the, what, as we just said, was proven on, 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 on in these theaters on the battlefield is is eloquent enough so from the Roman side. Uh, the some knights at some time or other involved most of Peninsular Italy in alliances against Rome, um, and when. The Romans finally defeated them. Uh, Rome had no difficulty uh, in overrunning even those peoples that had formerly been her allies. These and uh, had at that point the pretext for attacking the same Samnites. Uh, what we're not seeing here naturally is mostly the political relations that Rome was intertwined, not just through warfare but through probably the realization that, after all, being part of the Confederacy was not this huge uh, deal, right? That, again, if Rome had simply squeezed or destroyed or annihilated anything, we would have not had an empire to rule over. So, as we were saying before, there is a matter of moral superiority that Rome displayed uh, internationally, which is also something that we tend to not, not to appreciate because of course we are deapituated to consider the spiritual dimension and the fatal uh, mission that um, just Rome thought she had but she, she was demonstrating of being able to accomplish in front of all these other peoples that were saying but what is these are the chosen people because that's what really Rome was, was claiming. And as we were saying before, even less than one century before, the majority of these peoples would stand with Rome against the Carthaginians that even there didn't have the, 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 the manpower to hope to occupy the, the, the Italian interland. Right? This, they, they would have been just content, again, to, to maintain their own uh, commercial, coastal, maritime empire. Right? Uh, but that could have um, still, in fact, broken, and that they could have achieved that only if they had broken the Roman Italic Confederacy. The same peoples said no. Right? Centinum, as we were saying before, is a hell of a battle. We will probably make a video on uh, that. Um, in many ways, decided uh, the the game, at least as far as the internal forces of the Italian Peninsula were concerned. Right? Aside from this other leverage. Put by just by Hannibal, because at the end of the day there were no other occasions in which um, the the Italian peoples eventually rebelled to Rome to 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 bail out of it. 
right? This uh, this battle was fought notoriously by a coalition of Samnites, Gauls, Etruscans, and Umbrians um, against the Romans, of course, and that um, essentially crippled for good the Samnitic Confederacy. Um, it was fought in the north. Probably this had some, um, you know, some consequences also as far as the Samnitic intervention that even if it wasn't just, uh, it was, it was mirroring like a, a loss of importance of, 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 of the people like in the broader balance of the peninsula uh, could have, you know, uh, been played also closer to Rome and or this was actually threatening enough right and um, Rome did risk to fail right and, and she needed um, actually a decisive victory like the one she accomplished in in open field right? it was a very courageous and bold um, uh, choice as much as the one of the allies uh, was it was a, sh a final showdown naturally the the Romans interpreted the, the event in religious terms because there were some interesting appearances on on the battlefield of supernatural nature that probably Eco, some sort of still of um, uh, ritual duel before the the battle lines or something like that, but that are in fact lost a bit in the mystique of um, those those times and those those cultures. Um, in any case, this was a crushing defeat for the the enemies of Rome, and brought uh, definitely to the to the control of the entire uh, peninsula. Uh, Fabius Rullianus um, was the Roman commander uh, who in this sense achieved probably the single most important result in Rome's march to dominion uh, in Italy. So what mm, consequences that this bring well of course then the, the, the here we, we have seen even the Etruscans that had already you know declined significantly it, it was really the last hope for any of these people to, to have something to say after that um, just Rome had enough critical mass just to, to to smash these peoples right just in deterrence where so it would stay down um, and Rome went on consolidating mostly, in fact, a, a continental reality. At this point, famously enough, that the Senate was mostly concerned with um, the the agricultural dimension, right? Uh, of course, this would remain central, but there would be another in later times, also the one to which um, Scipio belonged during the Second Punic Wars. It was looking at more uh, maritime dimension, it was more Hellenistic in nature, and thus also more imperialistic and seen as, you know, also bold. And uh, you can appreciate how at the end of the 3rd century BC, the Roman establishment had basically said, we have one in Italy, we can relax, right? And they hadn't understood the potential that Italy had also in that imperial fashion. Because the Romans had never left the peninsula practically. Um, at least, you know, there had been the, 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 the first Punic War, of course, they had established properly an empire but um, it was already seen like to to stretch by some right they wanted mostly to, to remain uh, the at least some senators wanted to um, just benefit from the social mechanisms that had been triggered by the Roman conquest and so kind of more hinge control from the side of the aristocracy on on the on the latifundia increasing power in that base but it would have uh, actually given them again too much power and the Romans would have probably uh, uh, let's say too much stratified right they would have turned just in a kind of a sclerotically oligarchic system um, rather than one that could still co-opt the masses of the italics into the conquest of the Mediterranean so that's why the second Punic War is so pivotal in, in, in the just in the history of western civilization because um, it was not right. It, it tells you how much the awareness of the sacred can dim in the, in the soul of man, uh, even after this 
um, gigantic accomplishment. Actually, godlike accomplishment. This was the point because Rome had really clashed against Titans and had subjugated them and had created a new order that we can't also quite see so well because, um, um, say, the, the moment in which Rome starts talking about herself is, is much later uh, and also occurring after a, a big crack, like even the Battle of Cannae wiped out a consistent amount of the uh, Roman nobility so that there were new senators at some point that really came from, from a different background that, that they wouldn't embody or remember or know so fully what the true prestige of the of the past really was. I mean, it would have to be the, the Gens Julia to revive um, significantly, properly, the, the divine and regal, royal, um, and imperial nature of, uh, of Romanity in the truest blood of the, of the, of the Patres. Um, in any case, the Romans, as we've seen, were quite pragmatic. They would regularly confiscate land from their defeated foes. Right? If you wanted to just be an ally, you could. And you would just join the, the Roman oligarchy in occupying uh, an important amount of land, and so increasing your power at the expense of mostly the, uh, the people. Right? Because the uh, Ager Romanus, so what was basically the public demand, uh, consisted in uh, this, in fact, enormous amounts of lands that Rome had conquered by literally crushing entire peoples that had opposed herself, themselves to her. Um, and um, this, this would be not really assigned, like in the, col like some of them would, like if some colonies were found that there was probably a military nature, especially of the Roman colonies um, that generally was placed on Ammon posts in the frontier so sometimes also less relevant but the interland was mostly pacified and it wasn't quite assigned right the concept was that aside from a, a small part of assign, uh, assignations there would be this vast agar that could be occupied in theory by any Roman citizen if he had the means to do so, which means that naturally the senators could occupy with their slaves and um, clients and sometimes even forces um, their the, the huge amounts of lands and the average kind of file and rank legionnaire that had fought in these wars and that would, wanted to settle down and maybe had both slaves and um, you know just had cattle and stuff could could settle but was didn't let's say uh of course in the ancient world uh there was low there was regulation the romans were developing dramatically at this point exactly because of this enormous amount of land but the fact if you were uh, powerful you could have your rights defended if you were just an average guy again in the in central italy somewhere even far from rome um you couldn't quite do much, right? You had to be under somebody else. There were, there were signaries here, as a matter of fact. So, in practice, um, this would generate, on the longer run, the, what you see essentially in the second century BC, the so called recruitment crisis, for which Roman citizens had not just the, the duty but the privilege of bearing arms. And it wasn't like that anymore because the oligarchy was definitely too powerful. Um, you wouldn't have enough resources often just to just to be so uh, a de facto warrior that could leave as the, the the old tribal lifestyle was so having slaves uh, clients etc and going out there like a like a champion and winning wars and being a chieftain and ruling etc because you because the, the Roman classes were ever more kind of um, rigidly distinguished and there was not much of any mobility anymore, you would essentially destined to, to succumb in a way, and that's why the Marian reform is not much a military reform, but a, a political one, because it was just saying okay, you don't have to have enough you don't have to have anything, as a matter of fact but just being a Roman a citizen to uh, enlist uh, and then the state will pay 
for you. And when you read the state, read the senatorial oligarchy that had all the means, right? And so that's where you have the warlords of the first century BC. Um, and, uh, and it's a big step, but let's say by the third century BC, you still have the peak of Roman functionality, as Polybius was noticing from a political, military, and social point of view, that would be mostly, um, you know, showed during the, the the first two Punic Wars, right? So um, it's a bit of like the Golden Age. And when you look at the result, uh, of course, there were different, there the were, you know, this weren't just Romans, there were, again, territories of different peoples that had a treaties with Rome, the, the Sulci, that had their feather, their alliances, um, and still administered their land autonomously, right? As tribes, as mm, civitates, as um, other, you know, type of communities, right? And um, they had different roles. And there were some Roman citizens who preferred at some point to acquire the Latin citizenship because it gave in the short term more economical than political benefits so um, there was a you know a direction of that kind unsolved problems it would take a social war to actually fix the thing but uh, still it was at that point the beginning of first century bc just again having more rights within the roman system and absolutely not leaving it also because at that point there was literally nothing else um, in the Mediterranean, uh, to you know, to, to to participate. To um, what is um, amazing, however, is as we've seen the vast expansion of Roman territory throughout this just seventy years, um, and of course, in perspective, also just for the, the previous centuries. Um, consider that the Italian peninsula is somehow one hundred and thirty thousand square kilometers in area uh, and we have the measure of the Agar Romanus roughly it was by the end of the 6th century BC so at this point just the, the, the district of the city of Rome as something like a slightly above 800 square kilometers well by 340 it had reached 1900 square kilometers surface right so a good you know more than double right so we are at the end of what we we're looking at before like roman hegemony over the latin plain and this enormous pool of resources in 264 bc not even 80 years later Rome has an agar of more than 23,000 square kilometers. They basically more than decuplicated it. In just that short amount of time. So we, we will naturally make videos discussing what this brought to Rome because another it's not just about saying okay they, they forfeited the the confiscated uh, land of, of of their enemies and that's it right this this shaped Rome in a very specific way that we will look at in a, in another video. Um, what we notice here is the compactness of this domain, right? First of all, let's notice it on a map like it's territorially contiguous. The Agar Romanus ran. Uh, but the mid third century BC unbroken from the Caudine Forks in the south, uh, in the Samnium, to Ostia as the port of Rome on the Tyrrhenian Sea, and from the same Rome to Sena Gallica on the Adriatic Sea, essentially northern Italy, across the Apennines. Right. This this other aspect, the Apennines, the Romans had managed to control all the Apenninic passes. I mean, strategically speaking, for again a country that basically develops all in hills and mountains, especially in this um, uh, continental chain, controlling the passes means to control uh, at a relatively short distance. Because again, 
Italy is long and thin, right? Most so you can't actually go wherever you want, uh, channeling all these forces, and it's still again a, a massive surface altogether, um, and it, it it would allow the Roman legions to be projected strategically, basically everywhere, with an incredible speed, with this again well-oiled military machine that had proven to be able to stay out there for decades at war at hundreds of kilometers of distance already with a state de facto supplying also arms and armor Let, let's let's also break this um kind of myth right? again that before not just marius but even before somehow so before before in time that, that there was uh, a legionnaire who left home the farm uh, saying goodbye to, to wife and children, just taking his own personal scutum and his own um, uh, Lorica and, and, and Gladius and, and Pila and then all the stuff for, you know, prepared carefully by true Italic uh, women, um, cooked in... A, uh, no, like, the, the state was largely supplying this. Of course, it did derive from the... Uh, the, the the sweat and tears of, as we've seen here, hundreds of thousands of people already, um, but uh, it was evidently organized already in a very hierarchical fashion, in a very rationalized, uh, efficient, systematic way. It cost, right? It cost a lot. Rome was not really uh, immune from important swings here, right, uh, the, the Samnitic Wars did, again, put a considerable strain to the system, but it, 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 it this was afforded just because there was a Roman state who could manage the thing, and, and the, the establishment that ruled was essentially made up by the same generals that led the war, um, and that governed uh, the city, right, so they knew better how to organize this all, and this was an opportunity for the people as well, because they would still see, in spite of what, as we've seen, would happen later with the um, with the property issues, that still, you know, they would make more money, Rome would become more important, more international, more central, they would grab land, they were largely, again, um, how was land occupied? Of course, it was occupied mostly by the clients of a given um, lord, practically, that said, okay, let's go colonize this area that we have stripped from the polygony, let's assume. And you would send people there, and they would become administrators, naturally, of people that already inhabited there. So that's how it happened. Again, not it's the, the little guy that goes out there and says, okay, I want to establish a farm here. Right, it was already very collectively organized, um, and this is in fact what um, we can understand also during the uh, the wars against Pyrrhus, because um, you know the, the Hellenistic sovereign there showed a considerable impression for the the Roman host and its capacities to the point of saying like these are you know not bad for barbarians, right? Like saying you know. <laughs> Of course, Pyrrhus was was a you know quite of a of a character, and he was ironizing in typically kind of Macedonian way that on the kind of also Atlantic by some degree actually in thought um, on you know we Greeks think to be the best of everyone that we call other barbarians. Look at what these barbarians are able to do, right? And definitely Rome at this point is. A civilization during the essentially the first Punic War, the Romans really entered the Greek space f for real, right? You know, before they hadn't had made much contact aside from trade and this kind of peaceful relations, but occupying southern Italy, properly the the, the Atlantic colonies, uh, stepping into Sicily, opened Rome also to all notoriously a literature. Um, you know, different ideas. The, the Romans begin to write. Roman historiography begins, right? It's not just about sacred stuff or, you know, um, you know the, the, the organization of the Roman public uh, ceremonies or something. They start talking about themselves. They start representing themselves. 
very slowly because again the Romans were pretty rude in, in many ways and pretty rough, pretty ruvid. Um but they start acquiring some capacity for which they are just ready, in fact, with the Second Punic War to take the next civilizational step and taking over everyone. Um, so also something very different from naturally any political, military or social organization of other, say, continental powers, you know, talking about Central Europe fundamentally, um, and um, and something that we'll naturally see um, in some other video about. We, we didn't talk so much about the Punic Wars. Again, I should do it. Um, but you realize that um, this capacity of managing, also of uh, manumitting, like the idea that, for example, slaves could be freed. Right. This is something deeply related to the to the aforementioned concept of redemption. Like, I am the conqueror. I have been given by God the right of life and death on the defeated. And what do I do? I free the defeated. Which means, actually, in Roman law, that the person is a freedman. So you're, he's somehow related, still connected with, with his former master. And that's also how much of Roman clientels were established accordingly, which is quite interesting. It, 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 it is something that normally other peoples didn't do. I mean, they, they did it in other circumstances. We have examples from the, for example, the Germanic tribes, I don't know, and this is what's typical really, also among the Celts, when they needed manpower before a war, they freed the, the slaves, or at least they, they you know, elevated them to, to some sort of, of status that allowed them to bear arms, right, and that's what the health freeman technically is. You can find also in the early Middle Ages, still in the Romano-Germanic um, laws. And it's motivating because eventually your your children will be free de facto. They will be clients of someone. But that's kind of normal in the world of the time to be under somebody else. Like there is no other <laughs> way of living really unless you are not the top elite, right, in some way. Um, and this thing motivates these people, tells them, you know what, after all, we could have all been exterminated, we could have kept living in a sort of, you know, a, say, a Apenninic Heartland Confederacy, where basically we were all still different clans, more or less in rivalry with one another. Rome arrived and gives us a standardized possibility of essentially being part of, of the of her system and to work along it. Consider there was an ethnic proximity, of course, that say the Latin, the Oscans, as we've seen, as, as Italic peoples were pretty much, they spoke the same language. Um, they, 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 they didn't have much of a sense of a unitary sense of themselves because Italy was quite fragmented as such, but let's say uh, the Italic branch, right, that makes up the, the most of, of these peoples. Well, it's it's consistent, and it's especially composed by the most kind of half-barbarian, half half-civilized half peoples that have still all that also warlike potential to to be channeled in the, in the Roman allied uh, legions as well, right? So um, it's interesting... Um, Naturally, also the Etruscans, other non-Italic peoples, participated in like that. Or Celts, as we've seen. Um, I don't know if you look at um, the Velatrum in uh, in Etruria, you you find in the Etruscan um, necropolises um, Gallic elements that had integrated. Um, how, like you know, coming to trade, or were mercenaries, or something. So these peoples were somehow similar to each other. We've seen how. Also, the northern Italics were somehow very much in, say, in connected. Let's put it in this way with with the Celts themselves. Um, uh, there is a lot there, a lot of movements of peoples as well. We've seen it with the Gallic uh, sack of Rome. Also, you know, that marauding bands of, of warriors really crossed in, here and there. So it was a world that was compacting along patterns that must be gradually appreciated and definitely um, this principle of divide et impera 
had proven successful because it had given an opportunity also to the defeat right so the Samnites, the Tsar peoples could have at some point stopped Rome but the, the reason why they wouldn't historically must be understood along these patterns in other words Rome had something that they didn't have right and that's uh, also by scale actually but probably similar to, to what Rome actually did have yet not in the same measure and with the same vision and if you know what what vision means in in, uh, in Indo-European right it's the same uh, natural Latin root of video and the, the Vedic one probably that means the vision because thought and will there are one in the universal order right so this is crucial right and never underestimate when you read in Levy all those stories about almond about um, you know um, supernatural phenomena th th those people really still believed um, deeply and faithfully in such things and the religious aspect is excruciatingly important and very difficult to discuss because it also requires some competences and technicalities that must be cultivated over time we'll hopefully um, cover them for today however I stop it here we will go on with this um, also call it mini series about the Roman conquest of Italy for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content for now as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye